Good evening, and welcome to the final round of the Ames Moot Court competition. My name is Stacy Livingston. I'm the Vice President of the Board of Student Advisors and one of the primary organizers of the Ames Moot Court competition, along with the inimitable Yvonne Smith, Julia Keller, and Catherine Cronin. It's been an honor and a pleasure to work closely with these teams as they've progressed through the competition. And it's a joy to see them taking their places in a physical courtroom for the first time since this competition began for them more than a year ago. Presiding over this evening's competition will be the Honorable Elena Kagan of the United States Supreme Court, the Honorable Consuelo Callahan of the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, and their Honorable Kimberly Budd, Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. <laughs> this evening's case is written by Tejinder Singh, Harvard Law School class of 2008. It poses two key questions. The first is whether a court can exercise specific personal jurisdiction over a brand name drug manufacturer who promotes and sells its product in the forum state when a plaintiff was injured by the generic version of the same drug, which is required to copy the key features of the brand name drug by law. The second is whether AIMS statute section 5101 comports with due process to the extent that it conditions reg registration to do business in the state on consent to general personal jurisdiction in the courts of the state. Tonight, the petitioner, Charles Artis, will be represented by the Kerry E. Buck Memorial Team, which consists of John Acton, Jason Altavet, one of the team's oralists, Matt Bendish, Ryan Dunbar, Maria Hearn, and Fenella McCluskey, the team's other oralist. The respondent, Westlake Pharmaceuticals, will be represented by the Lila A. Fenwick Memorial Team, which consists of Chinyaria Munzi, one of the team's oralists, Avita Anand, Reagan Crisco, Sarah Marr, <laughs> um, sorry, Sarah Marr, Mariah Watson, and Morgan Sandu, the team's other oralist. Before we begin, Please remember that laptops, cell phones, and other personal electronics cannot be used in the courtroom at this time. Please ensure that they're all on silent before we begin. Please also remember that there will be no uh, photos or video that can be taken during the arguments. And please do not leave the courtroom during the argument. Thank you very much. Good luck to our teams, and enjoy the competition. All rise. The Honorable, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the United States Supreme Court. Oh yay, oh yay, oh yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this honorable court. Ms. McCluskey. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Fenella McCluskey, and together with my co-counsel, Jason Altabet, I represent petitioner Charles Artis. I will address specific jurisdiction, and my co-counsel will address consent jurisdiction. We respectfully ask to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Specific jurisdiction in this case turns on a single question. 
Is there a case-specific connection between Charles Artis's claim and Westlake's contacts with Ames? Under a straightforward application of Ford, the answer to that question is yes for two reasons. First, Westlake's marketing, sales, and distribution of brand name DZ in Ames plausibly increase consumption of generic DZ, the type of drug that Artis took. Second, Westlake has the exact same duty to warn consumers of generic DZ as consumers of brand name DZ, meaning that there is no reason for this court's jurisdictional analysis to distinguish based on whether a plaintiff took a generic or brand name version of the drug. Ultimately, Artis is not a forum shopper. He is bringing this case in its most natural forum, and Westlake is not substantially disadvantaged by have to, for having to litigate it here meaning that this case being heard in Ames comports with notions of fairness and federalism. Well, let's start, Ms. McCluskey, with your second point, which is whether it makes a difference that this is a product that the manufacturer here did not make. I mean, um, in Ford Motor Company, uh, one of the key sentences, it says, you know, why was there jurisdiction? is because Ford had systematically served a market in Montana and Minnesota for the very vehicles that the plaintiffs allege malfunctioned and injured them in those states. Now, uh, you didn't serve a market for this product. Uh, excuse, uh, you, you didn't make uh, the, the, um, the, uh, did, the, uh, the brand name manufacturer is a different manufacturer from the generic manufacturer. Why doesn't that make a huge difference? It's true, Your Honor, that the key difference, and in fact the only real difference between this case and Ford, is that here Westlake did not manufacture the actual pills that artists took. But this isn't a manufacturing claim. This is a failure to warn claim based on the contents of the label of generic DZ, which is identical to the label on brand name DZ. But how different can the product be before it's not the same? I think, as our Chief Justice said, in, in you know, would you argue that Ford's marketing related not only to specific Ford models, but to all cars in general? I mean, it, you seem to be arguing very expansively, so I'm concerned about what the limitation would be on relate to. Yes, Your Honor, and, and we're not at all arguing that Ford's marketing of other models of Ford cars would relate to the claims. Um, and here we think that the correct uh, level of generality is the drug, and so it is Westlake's brand name DZ contacts in Ames that relate to artists having been injured by the label on DZ. Because just to be clear, the label on generic DZ and brand name DZ are exactly the same, and so it makes sense to look at the level of DZ, the type of drug, when considering which of Westlake's forum contacts relates to Artis's claim. Does well, that, does that, I'm sorry. Ahead, I'm sorry. Does that mean that you could sue uh, Chevrolet because they had, but it was a Ford car, but you could sue Chevrolet because they had the same seatbelt manufacturer? No, Your Honor, because here uh, Artis is suing Westlake because Westlake actually authored the label that injured Artis. And so I suppose in, in your Chevrolet example, Justice Budd, uh, the plaintiff could probably sue the seatbelt manufacturer, uh, but it couldn't sue Chevrolet as Chevrolet had nothing to do with the making of the seatbelts. But well, you I'm sorry. No, please. But you seem to be arguing that the innovator liability theory that Ames imposes the same on the brand names as on the manufacturers caused by the generic. So ergo, you have the generic and therefore all, all the contacts that if the brand name had been the one that had caused the injury, you seem to say, well, automatically we just make that leap. Is there a case that supports that? Uh this court hasn't, and lower courts haven't really considered uh, innovative liability claims, but we would submit to the court that certainly innovative liability is, is different and perhaps it's even unique on the merits. But in terms of this court's jurisdictional inquiry, we're just asking the court to apply the exact same case as it does uh, in any other case. But aren't you asking that the theory of innovator liability essentially itself overcome what would otherwise be a glaring jurisdictional defect? which is that Westlake didn't make this product. Uh, two things, Your Honor. First, we think that who manufactured the product would be relevant if this were a manufacturing claim. 
but it's a labeling claim, and Westlake did in fact author the label. And so um, it depends, I suppose, what we call the product. In some sense, the product is the label. That's what injured artists, and Westlake actually made that label. Uh, and the second point but is- was the label made in Ames? No, the label was not. So made that in seems Ames. to be one of Westlake's argument is that this is the label is the whole thing, and you have no contact. You have no contacts and aims relative to the label. Well, Am I wrong on that? Uh, no, Your Honour, you're correct that the label wasn't made in Ames. <clears throat> but we think that Ford forecloses this argument because in Ford, the court held that. Um, Ford's manufacturing sales and reservicing contacts in Montana and Minnesota related to the plaintiff's claims that were essentially design defect type claims. Um, so although the fact that the Ford vehicles weren't designed, manufactured or first sold in the forum states, the court held that uh, West, uh, Ford's other contacts with the forum states counted for the relatedness inquiry. And so it's clear from Ford that it doesn't have to be the defendant's activities that uh, underlie the legal claim that are those that are relevant to the jurisdictional analysis. But, but again, Ford seems to be different because in Ford, I mean, if the Ford Motor Company, in some sense profited from this, the, the, the sale of the car that was involved in the accident, even though Ford itself didn't sell that car in the state. But here, it's very hard to see how Westlake profits from the sale of the generic drug. To the contrary, the generic drug is a competitor of Westlake's, and yet you're saying the jurisdiction can be based on that. So two things to that, Chief Justice Kagan. First, Westlake ac actively disclaims um, any reliance on profit. On page 21 of its brief, it says profit is not relevant to the relatedness inquiry. But even if it were, we think that Westlake profits off of um, artists, the, the facts that led to artists' claim in as direct a way as Ford did, namely, uh, Every time a prescription is filled, or every time a prescription is written for DZ without specifying the brand, that prescription can be filled with either generic DZ or brand name DZ. So here it happened to be filled with generic DZ. But had artists continued taking this drug, it could have been filled with brand name DZ in the future. So Westlake has the possibility of profiting off of this prescription, just as Ford had the possibility of profiting off of the cars through, for example, reservicing. And we also think that the broader scheme that makes Westlake liable for the label on brand name, on generic DZ in addition to brand name DZ, is one from which Westlake profits. Well, admittedly, I read your brief and you played the violin quite well about how sad this is for the disabled uh, person and how easy it would be just for Westlake to come and defend. But I'm still not quite understanding when you say the relate to test can be satisfied even by uh, potential causation, for example, because Westlake's promotional efforts might have caused artist's doctor to prescribe DC. But doesn't that rule render the arising out of part of the formulation basically superfluous? So it, if even potential causation is enough to create that minimum context, then why bother even having the half of the formulation that deals with actual causation at all. So I, I just, I'm not understanding the test that you're as, asking us to apply. So to be clear, we're not asking that this court adopt some kind of plausible causation test. Rather, we think that plausible causation is one way to illustrate the way in which a claim can connect to a defendant's forum contacts. And we get that idea from the Ford opinion, specifically pages 13 to 14 of the slip opinion, when the court talks about how the plaintiffs may never have bought the Ford vehicles except for Ford's extensive contacts. And it makes the court makes it clear, of course, that the defendants, the plaintiffs don't need to prove those uh, that causation because that would be explicit causation which the court rejected. Um, but it says that the possibility of that causation uh, makes jurisdiction act. But isn't there a difference because Ford in that case knew very well that by um, its marketing activities, its servicing activities, that it was increasing the demand for its product everywhere, both in state and potentially out of state. Um, but here, uh, you know, Westlake is not trying to up the demand for generic drugs. Again, uh, more people buy generic drugs, the less money Westlake makes. 
Uh, it's true that it may not be trying to up the demand for generic drugs, but it certainly is, and we believe that it is aware of that. Um, surely Westlake Pharmaceutical Company is aware of the dynamics of drug prescriptions in Ames and in other states, and it knows that when it tries to persuade pharmacists to prescribe its drug, a lot of them will end up prescribing DZ without specifying the brand, and that that, that will be filled with either brand name or generic. Um, and so we think that it is foreseeable to Westlake that it would be held liable for plaintiffs who had taken generic DZ. And you keep saying that it's possible that he, the, your client could have taken the uh, Westlake drug, but we know that he didn't take the Westlake drug. So just getting back to basics, if it wasn't Westlake who provided the, the, the drug, why should they have to answer for the for the injury? Because, Your Honor, Westlake provided the label, and it is that label, not the way the drug was manufactured, that injured artists. Well, it seems so. What do we do about the fact that any demand Westlake generated for the generic DC was likely just an unintended consequence for Westlake's, from Westlake's perspective? It seems Westlake's best argument is here is that the marketing was about a different product. Uh, which is unlike Ford. So I'm still struggling with that. Uh, two things, Your Honor. First, Westlake is certainly marketing brand name DZ, but it's certainly aware that that marketing will increase sales and consumption of generic DZ, and it's that awareness, that foreseeability and opportunity to structure its conduct that this court is concerned with. And second, in some sense, Ford would have profited more if it had sold first-hand vehicles. But nonetheless, the court in Ford held that it was cultivating a market for second-hand vehicles. And so there's a kind of indirectness in Ford that uh, is mirrored here. In Ford, the court specifically reserved the question of whether there would be jurisdiction if Ford had not marketed the uh, vehicle brand in state, so if, say, the Ford Explorer had been marketed only in a different state from the one the manufacture, uh, the one in which the accident occurred. Now, let's say we had not reserved that, that question. Let's say that, in fact, there would have been no jurisdiction um, if the Ford Explorer had been marketed um, only in Florida, which was not the state in which the accident occurred. Would then your argument be impossible to make? Not at all, Your Honor. We think it would be exactly the same. Um, because Westlake markets DZ in Ames, uh, it is that, that contact with Ames is connected to Artis's claim. Now, the analog uh, to, to your hypothetical, Your Honor, is if Westlake had not marketed, sold, and distributed DZ in Ames. Rather, it had only promoted its other drugs. And there we agree there would not be jurisdiction, because there would be- So you do concede that much? Uh, Yes, had Westlake. There would not be sufficient contacts if they had not marketed the, the brand name. If they had no contacts whatsoever related to DZ in Ames, yes. Because but if they had no contacts whatsoever or if they had not marketed it in Ames? If they had no DZ related contacts. So we think that even absent Westlake's marketing, its sales and distribution of brand name DZ still relate to Artis's claim. But if it didn't have any DZ related contacts in Ames, then uh, there would be no um, specific jurisdiction. At some point, we have to figure out what this relates to means in a way that people can apply. Like, what should the rule be? When does uh, litigation sufficiently relate to? Uh, the forum state such that specific jurisdiction exists? Two things, Your Honor. First, we don't think the court has to answer that question here because this is a straightforward application of Ford. And so we would urge the court to do as it did in Ford, say there are real limits to relates to. Um, but because this case is not anywhere near those limits, uh, it doesn't need well, to. Well, those were just words, right? I mean, whoever wrote that. <laughs> What, what, what did that mean exactly? Real limits. What real limits? It is, it is this court's tradition uh, in specific jurisdiction cases to go incrementally. And so we think the court need not define the precise boundaries. That being said, if the court wants to give guidance to the lower courts on what relates to means, we think the court could emphasize two things. Uh, the first is to bring out something the court said in Ford, which is that uh, the plaintiffs there weren't forum shoppers. And we think it's important to emphasize that 
the plaintiffs aren't trying to game the system, that this is actually a rational place to bring. Does Ford allow you to argue that the potential is enough, the potential for causation? Does Ford allow you to make that, is, is it, does it naturally flow from Ford? That, that is our reading of, of pages 13 to 14 of the slip opinion, because the court uses this except for language, that except for uh, Ford's forum contacts, the plaintiffs may Well, what not if after discovery, it turns out that it became clear that your client's doctor did not prescribe DC because of Westlake's promotional efforts? Could the defendants then move for summary judgment on personal jurisdiction grounds? Uh, no, we don't believe so. We believe it's the possibility of, of the causal link. So but if, you, but if, the, if taking discovery rules out that possibility, then do you still lose in the end? No, Your Honor. In footnote 5 of Ford, the court said that even if the plaintiffs had moved to the jurisdictions one day ago and had never seen any of Ford's contacts, there would still be jurisdiction. Um, I see my time has run out. I would urge the court to find that specific jurisdiction is proper here. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Altebet. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. Six years ago, Westlake consented to a simple agreement that it would accept the jurisdiction of Ames's courts in exchange for the benefits of being a registered foreign business in the state. Now, twice since that initial agreement, Westlake has renewed its consent and it has never attempted to withdraw. Today, however, it asks this court to invalidate its prior consent under the Due Process Clause. But for two, under one of two principal paths, this court should reject that request. The first path is simply reaffirming this court's longstanding precedent that a corporation validly consents to jurisdiction when it signs and files the appropriate registration paperwork so long as state law explicitly links registration to consent. Now well, that's a result if the that- the state passed a law saying that anybody who registers to do business in a state is subject to general jurisdiction, that would be unconstitutional under Daimler, wouldn't it? Why does adding the label of consent make a constitutional difference? Uh, two uh, reasons for that, Your Honor. The first flows from this court's longstanding precedent in Pennsylvania Fire and Robert Mitchell Company and in Nerbo, where it says that mandating jurisdiction in a statute is different than actually offering a bargain to a company. So there, for example, in Pennsylvania Fire, there was notice that by uh, meeting the registration threshold and actually registering, a company would be subject to general jurisdiction. I don't know. This just seems like an attempt to evade Daimler. I mean, Daimler could have said, oh, by the way, you know, there are these very old cases which suggests that a court can just get around everything that we're saying here. But it didn't. It thought that what, they, what, what we said here had some meaning, with that general jurisdiction was for where a corporation was at home, its state of incorporation or its principal place of business, the end. Your Honor, I think uh, looking at uh, Daimler and Goodyear, there's a couple of reasons why this is not simply moving past them. The first is that the court there explicitly noted that this was about a non-consenting defendant. And it pointed to the Perkins case, the sort of paradigmatic general jurisdiction case that this court often looks to to understand where is context-based general jurisdiction valid. And when it points at Perkins, it says two things. First, it says this is a Perkins case is about a not consenting defendant. And then it talks about notice and structure being the two key principles behind general jurisdiction. And in cases where a corporation is not consented to jurisdiction, that makes a lot of sense. The essentially at home test gives notice and it allows structuring of conduct. But in situations like this one with consent, corporations also have the ability to have notice and to structure their conduct. And in fact, in footnote four well, in, of in what way does a corporation really have the ability to do that? I mean, how is this consent to say to the corporation, well, you know, it's, it's like a gun to the head. You better sign this piece of paper or else you can't do any business in this state. Well, the registration clauses have real limits in, in every state, both under this court's precedent and just generally as common practice. In Ames, for example, if Westlake had used a third party entity, if it had structured its primary conduct inside of the state below the level of registration, or if it had severed its non-interstate conduct uh, from the inter, uh, intra uh, Ames market, then it wouldn't have had to register. There are a variety of choices that corporations have, 
And you know, we agree with I mean, Westlake. All, all bad ones, right? Well, we, we agree with Westlake. Of course, uh, these choices are, you know, it's, it's a legitimate choice. You have to either decide how you're going to structure your interstate conduct or consent to general jurisdiction. But this court has often allowed consent to jurisdiction in these sorts of circumstances. Well, give me an example of what would have gone too far. Since you say this statute, this is, this is fine, what would have gone too far if it had been there? What would have gone too far? For a business registration statute, for example, under this court's precedent, if the what Ames had said selling a single product into our state constitutes business registration and thus you must consent to general jurisdiction, this court has long past said that that is not allowed. That well, how is that any different? Where, where do you draw the line? What does that line look like? It, it's drawn on the localized character and the substantial business activities. So the, the statute itself and the Supreme Court of Ames says that there must be a substantial business inside of Ames in order to qualify for registration. And this court in a long line of cases has said under interstate commerce, a registration clause can only affect localized interstate activity. And that makes sense because states cannot simply disrupt the interstate economy. So there has to be something about the actual use of the state's economy that gives it a justification to use these registration clauses. Well, I find your argument a little bit circular. In response to the unconstitutional conditions argument, you argue that there is no constitutional right to personal jurisdiction and that there is only a due process right not to have property taken without due process. Um, but in the Insurance Corporation of Ireland, didn't we expressly say that the requirement of personal jurisdiction represents, first of all, an individual right? So what authority do you have for, um, for saying that for the proposition that, are, that there is no right to personal jurisdiction? I think there's a couple of important places to look at. The first is in Bauxite's itself, uh, footnote 10 of that case. The court says, you know, of course this is an individual right, and it's waivable because uh, people are allowed to put themselves to the submission of a state's courts through a variety of means, for example, voluntary state procedures, and more generally, the court's saying this is not just about uh, fundamentally something that you can't get rid of. You're always allowed to have a procedure by which this is satisfied. That's why form selection clauses exist. It's why, for example, if I was a plaintiff and I had a cross claim against me, I would have it consented to personal jurisdiction in that case, even though now I'm a defendant, perhaps in a state where I actually don't have minimum contacts. That comes from the same uh, case. Second, this court in Nairbo actually addressed the unconstitutional conditions uh, possibility for this and said, hold on a second, for these consent through registration clauses, we're talking about a way of regulating the procedure by which due process is satisfied. Uh, the court well, said- so if, part of, if, if part of what it means is to not have one's property taken without due process, is, is to not have it taken by a tribunal that lacks jurisdiction over the person. So if you are being asked to waive that, objection, why aren't you being asked to give up a constitutional right in exchange for a government benefit in a way that implicates an unconstitutional, the unconstitutional uh, conditions doctrine? In short, looking to the Nerbo case, we think of it like this. Due process is the right not to be subject to a state's jurisdiction without a fair process that reasonably you know, effectuates the right. And one way of effectuating that right is consent to jurisdiction. Another way is if you haven't consented, as long as it's your place of incorporation or your principal place of business, or if it's a specific jurisdiction case, that you've done enough business activities related to the lawsuit that you're dealing with such that it's fair to hail you in. You know, the usual cases about consent look very different from this one. Usually we're talking about um, a party consenting to a particular suit, or maybe we're talking about a party consenting to any suit brought under a particular contract. But here, it's like you're consenting to the entire world of claims that can be brought against you. I, I mean, at that, at that point, are we really even uh, thinking about the same thing? I think we are, Your Honor, for a couple of reasons. To the extent breath has been important in the court's doctrine, it seems to be about whether it's going to voluntariness. Was it a voluntary agreement? Because there's all sorts of ways to subject yourself to a lot of cases in a completely unrelated state. For example, if Westlake had a 10,000-person union 
and uh, they signed an agreement with that union that said any employment actions will be brought in Florida, no matter how related they are to Florida. They could be facing thousands of lawsuits in Florida, and you know, to the extent that that was a voluntary agreement, under this court's precedent, that would be approved as a consent to jurisdiction. And we understand this is broad. This is general jurisdiction. But we think that the real limits in terms of what registration clauses can cover, the structural options that corporations have, and overall the fact that, particularly in a case like this, what Ames has less than 1% of the U.S. population. And is there no such thing as just saying the consequences of withdrawing uh, here are just so grave that we're not thinking of this as truly voluntary consent? I think there, there could be circumstances case-specific where that would be true, depending on the, how the business registration clause was. And like what? So, for example, let's say that the state of California had a business registration clause that said having a single person inside of the state from your company for more than a month uh, constitutes business registration. Now, first, I think that would raise serious interstate commerce problems. But that also would probably implicate the due process clause in terms of is this a truly voluntary agreement? And, and we agree there's a very important aspect of voluntariness throughout well, the court's case. Why law. does that say anything about voluntariness? I mean, I, I can see you saying this has a different interstate commerce dimension, but it seems to me that as long as the consequence is the same, which is, sorry, you can't do business here. The voluntariness of your example is the exact same as the voluntariness of this actual case. Well, in this case, Westlake is able to do substantial interstate business and do it continuously. That is the amount that is necessary to hit registration. But if it doesn't do substantial business, if it doesn't do it continuously, under the statute and under the Supreme Court of Ames's ruling, it wouldn't have to register. That's do you have a really sense of what substantial is and what continuously is? Well, the Supreme Court of Ames discusses Westlake's 40-person marketing team and says that's an example of substantial business. That's on page 8 and 9 of the, Supreme, of the record, and it's the Supreme Court of Ames' opinion. And we think that's an important way of thinking about this, because it actually mirrors very closely the court's interstate commerce versions. Well, that's an example, but where's the line? Is it 40, 50, 30? What, what, what's, what, is there a number attached to this? Uh, no, Your Honor, but in the same way that standards and statutes are developed over time through judicial opinion, we think that's available here. But moreover, even if that weren't sufficient, there's a number of different options Westlake has. It could ask for an opinion from the State Attorney General's office, asking what are the consequences of keeping this sort of operation. Uh, the State Secretary of State has to give it a certificate of occupancy and a state tax code if it registers or if it hits a substantial business. And so well, you you're telling the them how to do business, but we're really looking at the statute. You're saying they could do business all of these different ways, but isn't it really come down to, is, does the statute put a gun to their head? Yes, Your Honor, and I think the way you look at the sort of gun to your head formulation for unconstitutional conditions, or more broadly, is the idea of what options do they have? Well, are you the person to, to ask about fairness and fair play and substantial justice? I can discuss that, Your Honor. So, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> Well, you can discuss anything we want to talk about, really. <laughs> Your Honor, whatever you want. Yeah. How do we balance the state's interests here with Westlake's interests? I, I, I said to, I think, your co-counsel that you played a pretty good violin, making us feel sorry for your client. But, you know, but we have to, you know, but it isn't always the person that has the saddest story that when you're balancing state interests and your interests, can you tell me why this is fair play and substantial justice? Yes, Your Honor. In the McGee case, the court talked about how states have a really manifest interest in ensuring that its citizens receive redress in court. And so at the very least, in a case like this, you know, Artis is a citizen of Ames who has lived in Ames for all the relevant times. He was injured in Ames by a label sent into Ames uh, by a corporation that designed the label and uses that label all the time in Ames. We think from a fair play and substantial justice formulation, that's a really you know, important way of thinking about the state has a real interest here. And more broadly, if this court were to conclude on the specific jurisdiction grounds that you know, we think forward, it's a straightforward application, but if this court would reject specific jurisdiction, the only option left for an AIM citizen to sue would be under this consent statute. And in a way, these consent through registration statutes act as a stopgap measure. It allows for people to bring lawsuits in places where it's important for them to do so. And when a corporation consents voluntarily to that formulation, it seems to satisfy due process, both under this court's precedent, in Pennsylvania Fire and the like, and moreover, under these general principles of consent that this court I'm having trouble about. with the foreseeability 
So I understand that Westlake may consent to suits that have to do with them, but how could they possibly know that they they may be sued by somebody who hasn't even taken their uh, their pro who hasn't even used their product? Where does the line drawn with regard to who gets to who who gets to say? Uh, Sure. So for the innovator liability portion of that, we think you know state law is going to attach duties to various actions. And so if we're talking about innovator liability, then the fact that a state says this is how we think about liability in a failure to warrant context. I mean, for example, if a physician says that you should take this prescription drug and then someone gets injured by it, you know, the duties that attach at the physician level, Westlake is well aware of that. But in terms of the consent jurisdiction context, you know, having to face suit on general jurisdiction grounds. We think it's important to note that already Westlake faces consent uh, through essentially a type of registration in terms of its incorporation, right? So let's say hypothetically Westlake was incorporated in Delaware and it only had a mailbox there. It could face suit on any liability in Delaware despite having no contacts. And also in its principal place of business, it always faces general jurisdiction. But there's a so, difference between being subject to jurisdiction general jurisdiction in two states and being subject to general jurisdiction in 50 states, which is how many it's going to be once states get a hold of the idea that they can do this. Well, Your Honor, just briefly I would say I don't think that all states are going to implement something like this. At the very least, almost 20 percent of states have statutes saying, hey, we don't want our registration clauses to ever be read as constituting consent through registration. So there's obviously some incentive to pass business-friendly statutes that don't include this. More broadly, however, there's always going to be the choice of whether to go consent in one state or another state. So, for example, let's say Alabama has the worst innovator liability law, and Westlake says, I never want to be subject to that. Well, unlike doing business jurisdiction in the Daimler, in the pre-Daimler and Goodyear era, it has the choice to not consent in Alabama. It can focus on interstate sales, which won't implicate registration. It has the option to use third-party entities to avoid consent. It has all of these options to avoid what would be the biggest problem in doing business jurisdiction, find where the best law is and sue. And your, your, your theory, Mr. Altavet, relies on some very old cases. And I realize we haven't formally overruled those cases. But we haven't relied on them in a very, very long time. Aren't they essentially reversed? I don't think so, Your Honor, for a couple of reasons. First, uh, this court has cited those cases as late as in the Perkins case in 1952, which the court always uh, cites back to as the paradigmatic general jurisdiction case. Um, in the Bendix case not too long ago, the court assumed that consent to registration could be valid. I see my time has nearly expired. You can finish. quickly finish your answer. And uh, in conclusion, it's not uh, attached to the fictions of the Penoyer era that this court has always said have been effectively overruled in the past. It involves an actual consent that falls in line with this court's cases. And accordingly, we ask that this court reverse the Supreme Court of Ames below on either the specific jurisdiction framework or consent. Thank, Thank you, you, counsel. Thank you. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. My name is Chinyeri Amunzi, and I, along with my co-counsel, Ms. Morgan Sandu, are representing the respondent, Westlake Pharmaceuticals. I will address the issue of specific jurisdiction, and Ms. Sandu will address the issue of general jurisdiction. Your Honors, this case is about the awesome power of personal jurisdiction, and the thoughtful, thorough, and fair limits the Due Process Clause places on the exercise of this power. Here, petitioner asserts that Ames State has specific jurisdiction over his negligent and reckless labeling claim against Westlake Pharmaceuticals, but this cannot be true for three reasons. First, the essential tenet of specific jurisdiction is a connection between the plaintiff's claims and the defendant's actions in the forum state. There is no such connection here. Why isn't there a connection if the reason that the um, plaintiff was injured was the label that Westlake put on its product? There is no connection for two reasons, Justice Bud. First, the injurious product does not belong to Westlake. It is wholly owned by Santos Laboratories. But that's not, that wasn't what they're arguing. They're arguing that the label was, was faulty, not the product. Even if we look at the label as the product that turns this case, 
As the petitioner has long noted, and as the Ames Superior and Supreme Courts have also agreed, none of Westlake's labeling activities take place in Ames. And so that supports, again, a finding that Ames does not have specific- Well, I mean, suppose that this were um, your product, or, you know, the fact that the labeling is not in this state, would that have made a difference under Ford? Yes. Under Ford, this court spoke extensively about the fact that Ford systemically served Wait, the market. Before you say that, I want to understand. If this had been your product, it wasn't the generic, are you saying uh, there still wouldn't have been personal jurisdiction? My apologies, Justice Callahan. If this had been our product, there would be specific jurisdiction under this court's precedent in Ford. Okay, and, and that's even if the labeling was done in some other state. Isn't that right? That is correct. So why is it any different here? You know, Ford is basically, it was, it was not a labeling claim, it was a design defect claim. And Ford said it doesn't matter if the uh, product was designed in some other state, still there's personal jurisdiction here. And similarly, it doesn't matter that the labeling was put together in some other state, still there's personal jurisdiction here. Why isn't it the exact same? It is the reasoning in Ford that counsels this court today to take a different analysis. In Ford, this court spoke extensively about the fact that Ford systemically served the market for its own products, that it asked residents of Montana and Minnesota to use those products, to become lifelong users of those products, and then when those same residents were injured, tried to disclaim jurisdiction. But here again, the critical difference between the case before this court today and Ford is the fact that the but product- But I think, and this goes back to Justice Budd's question, you're kind of fighting the substantive liability statute. There is a statute, and it's not an issue in this case, which says that you are as responsible for the product that the generic manufacturer puts on as you are for, uh, for, for the, the, the label that the generic manufacturer puts on, as you are for the label that you put on the brand product. And if that's the case, why should there be any difference? While that is correct, the innovator liability theory itself also counsels this court to take a different analysis. In the two seminal cases that established that theory, Novartis in California and Merck in Massachusetts, both of those cases spoke extensively about the labeling activities of brand name pharmaceutical companies. Well, except I guess innovator liability is not subject here. And so that, yes. that exists. You just conceded that if it were your product here, that there would be personal jurisdiction. So innovator liability says generic and brand exactly the same. So where's the, where's the daylight here? I, I'm going, if that, then this, how do you get around that? The theory of innovator liability recognizes the fact that the two products must be biochemical equivalents, but it does not conflate the two products into one. It in fact still recognizes that one product is the brand name product and the other belongs to a wholly separate You see, company. I think you're just fighting the substantive statute. I mean, I can understand why. You know, somebody's saying, why should we be responsible for somebody else's product? But the legislature has said the reason you should be responsible for somebody else's product is that they have to put your label on their product. So you're just as responsible for their product as you are for your own. In which case, as Justice Callahan just said, I guess I don't see where the daylight is. Why doesn't it follow as night the day from Ford? Two points in response, Chief Justice Kagan. First, we do not fight the underlying question of liability. We simply assert that Ames is not the proper forum to hear that question. It may be helpful to turn to another court, the Southern District of Florida, that has considered this exact question, specific jurisdiction when a negligent and reckless labeling claim is based on the theory of innovator liability, both pre and post Ford. Pre Ford, the Southern District of Florida mistakenly relied on but for causation. And upon allowing rehearing after Ford, it still held that specific jurisdiction is inappropriate unless the labeling activities of the brand name pharmaceutical company occurred in that state, because that is the underlying core conduct, the underlying reasoning for the innovator liability theory in the first place. To allow otherwise would be to stretch both the theory of innovator liability and specific jurisdiction itself to the point of being almost unrecognizable. Well, I, I guess I asked this of 
your colleagues on the other side, your dear friends on the other side. How would you have us decide when a conduct, when a, when a contact is related to a claim? It obviously has to be more than just causation. Can you give us a rule that we can use so that we can decide this case? Yes, we would adopt the same rule that this court put forward and forward, that there must be a strong nexus between the plaintiff's claims and the defendant's actions in the forum state. Well, so Ford seems to leave open, though, the option of potential. Uh, someone named Justice Kagan wrote in there that, <laughs> I was, uh, that, um, that, that it, there could be, that it seems to leave that open. But I can't, I can't speak for that individual. So <laughs> what's the, uh, can what, you tell what us? What is thinking about? <laughs> yeah. While there is potential, and even in Ford, to previous questions, the fact that the product design and manufacturing did not occur in Montana or Minnesota was not dispositive, that should make a difference here today when the injurious product does not belong to the defendant. So Ford is distinguishable here today, but the rule still applies. We do not ask this court to depart from Ford, simply to find that when there is a disconnect between the defendant and the injurious product, that that strong nexus cannot be satisfied by simply pointing to Westlake marketing and selling its own product. But, but the, the, this claim has nothing to do with the making of the product. It has something to do with the labeling of the product. I guess this is another way of an, asking the exact same question. It has only something to do with the labeling of the product, which in fact Westlake does. Westlake puts its label on this other product even though it didn't make it. And if the idea of specific jurisdiction is a connection between the defendant and the forum and the litigation, meaning the claim, mm -hmm. this claim is only about the labeling. We agree that this claim is about the labeling and that specific jurisdiction requires a connection between the plaintiff's claims and critically the defendant's actions in the forum state. But and I guess, but you said you would defend the claim in Ames if it were your product. So. By deciding to serve Ames Market, you have already signed up to defend products liability actions brought by Ames residents in Ames courts, including actions about the adequacy of your label. Because if your own product injured an Ames residents, they could sue you. So what's unfair about having to defend this generic? It is un it's the same thing. While Westlake would be responsible for defending the claim if the petitioner had taken Luxon, the fact that he has not changes the analysis of fairness in this case because it begins to speak to the due process rights of the defendant. I mean, it's an accident that he didn't take the brand name product, right? It's just whatever the pharmacist decides to give the patient. So could easily have taken your product. We actually think that is not quite as accidental as it seems. As this court noted in the Pliva dissent, and even in Merck, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court case that established innovator liability for that state, once a generic version of a product enters the market, it can quickly become up to 90% of that market. And many states have adopted statutes that either suggest or even require pharmacists to fill prescriptions with the generic product. And so it is very likely that if petitioner had continued to fill that prescription, Santos Laboratories would have continued to benefit. And it is this reality of the pharmaceutical industry that also counsels this court not to allow specific jurisdiction today. Because under petitioner's version of specific jurisdiction, Westlake, for simply marketing and selling its own products in an attempt to recoup the substantial investment necessary to create Luxon, would now be open to jurisdiction from anyone who had taken any version of any generic of Westlake's products. And we think that under Ford, we see that that strong relationship cannot be satisfied in this way. Counsel, you argue that there's no contact because the labeling didn't take place in the forum state. Is that right? And that when you say the labeling didn't take place, are we talking about the creation of the language? Are we talking about the slapping of the actual label on, on the product? What are, what are we talking about? We use a broad definition of labeling activities that includes any action that has to do with the development, construction, or manufacturing of the label. So anything from the clinical research that went into making Luxon or 
the printing and slapping of the label, but as petitioner has long conceded, none of that activity has taken place in Ames. Well, the other the side th makes an argument that they said, we would accept your rule that every case would be dismissed in a failure to warn case that wasn't brought in the company's home state because the labeling decisions would always be made out of state. So what reassurances can you give us that this wouldn't be true? Two points in response, Justice Callahan. First, this would only apply to negligent and reckless labeling claims based on the innovator liability theory. To your earlier question about what would happen if the petitioner had taken Luxon, in a regular failure to warn claim, claim in that case, specific jurisdiction would be appropriate, and that would fall directly under Ford. And again here, even if this court were to disallow a finding of specific jurisdiction in this case today, petitioner and those like him still have other forms where they can bring their claim. Notably, any forum state where the labeling activity did take place, or even Delaware and New Jersey, which undoubtedly have jurisdiction over Westlake, and both of which have choice of law statutes that may allow petitioner to still access the innovator liability theory. So there is much assurance that a finding that specific jurisdiction is not allowed today does not foreclose petitioner or anyone like him or failure to warn claims writ large. Instead, disallowing Ames from having specific jurisdiction falls directly in line with this court's prior specific jurisdiction precedent and balances the need for access to the innovator liability theory, which again, we are not contesting, while also respecting the due process rights of defendants and not subjecting Westlake and any other brand name pharmaceutical company to jurisdiction and an exceptionally broad swath of jurisdiction. Well, why should we you know, feel sorry for Westlake here? I mean, Westlake is a huge company. It litigates uh, uh, claims like this all over the country. It, pro it litigates claims just like this in the state of Ames involving its own products. Um, there would be no, different, no difference in the way the, the suit would work, whether it was a generic or the brand name product. Um, uh, you know, why isn't it completely fair to subject Westlake to suit in the state of Ames? Turning to fairness, it is not fair because that would be a violation of Westlake's due process rights. And the fairness analysis... Well, you know, part of what it means to be a due process right has to do with, does this seem fair? This seems pretty darn fair to me. I mean, Westlake is litigating these suits all over the country, including in the state of Ames. What's the problem with litigating one more? Don't forget the other side's disabled, too. Don't forget <laughs> that. You're multi-billion dollar other side disabled. Turning to this court's five fair play and substantial justice factors, this would violate those factors for three reasons. First, the interstate judiciary has an interest in efficiency. And efficiency is often defined as not dragging out litigation for unnecessarily long periods of time. Looking at petitioner's claim I itself- I mean, I have to say efficiency sort of suggests to me that Westlake can litigate this suit here just as, just as it's litigating many suits of the exact same kind here. Rather than asking uh, Mr. Atlet, Artis, who has been uh, allegedly injured by your product, to fly across the country and use, you know, lawyers that it, he doesn't have in a different state. I, I, you want to just talk about like fairness and equity? Seems as though it's all on one side here. That side not being yours. <laughs> <laughs> Two points in response, Chief Justice Kagan. Uh, to borrow some language from the Northern District of Texas in a case called Groom, litigating a suit in a foreign forum is not a trivial burden. Fairness and this court's analysis of fairness has always been well. Punchy. However, not a trivial burden. It is. It's a much less. It's a much. I mean, it's a much more serious burden for Mr. Artis than it is for Westlake Company that is doing business in the state of Ames, that has lawyers in the state of Ames, that is li litigating other essentially identical suits in the state of Ames. It will litigate a few more. It would litigate quite a few more, Chief Justice Kagan. To use a more common language sense of fairness, again, allowing specific jurisdiction in this case would open up Westlake and any other brand name pharmaceutical manufacturer to a broad swath of jurisdiction from anyone who has consumed a generic version of its product. Westlake has no control over if, when, or how many companies decide to profit off of its substantial research and investments to create those products. 
But that's an objection to the substantive liability statute, but that's not an issue in this case. No, it is simply, it is not an issue in this case. And again, we do not object to the innovator liability theory, but we object to the contention that specific jurisdiction is appropriate when a claim is brought based on that theory solely because Westlake or any company like it has decided to market and sell its own products. Well, let me take you back to if I was stumbling over the arise out of and relate to test. If they can't make that, if you're, the other side cannot, if the petitioner can't make that, do we get to the fairness argument? Yes. We would still get to the fairness argument even if this court found that arise out of or relates to was not met today because as this court expressed an international shoe, a finding of specific jurisdiction must always be in line with fair play and substantial justice to be constitutional. So, but if they can't show it relates to, don't they just lose there or do we, that's what I'm asking, or do they get to then still, can they make up for that with fairness? Can fairness make up for if you can't meet the element mm -hmm. of arise out of or relate to? What happens if they don't meet that argument? Is then, it over? No, then that would not work. All three are required for a finding of specific jurisdiction to be appropriate. Purposeful availment arises out of and relates to and comporting with fair play and substantial justice. And as this case or finding a specific jurisdiction would not, we respectfully request that this court affirm the decision of the Ames Supreme Court. Thank you, Ms. Avance. Ms. Sandu. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court. As this court has made clear, not once, not twice, but three times, a corporation may be subjected to general jurisdiction only where essentially at home. General jurisdiction allows a state to hear all claims by all plaintiffs at all times, regardless of their connection to the forum state. A grant of such expansive jurisdictional power must have correlative limits. But didn't Westlake consent to this jurisdiction? Your Honor, while Westlake did comply with Statute 5101, we don't believe that this constitutes consent for two reasons. The first is that, as defined by Black's Law Dictionary, Consent requires a voluntary yielding to the desires or wishes of another. Here, there is no voluntariness. There is no Well, I don't understand that. I mean, you signed a piece of paper, right? And what's not voluntary about that? Voluntariness requires alternatives, particularly the alternative. There's an alternative here. I mean, you'll make less profits if you don't sign that piece of paper. Yes, Chief Justice Kagan, we would lose our profits by not being able to engage with the Ames market. Anytime somebody doesn't make as much profits as otherwise, that's not voluntary? No, it's not voluntary here for two key reasons. The first is that while Westlake has the option to withdraw from Ames, lower courts who have been asked to address this exact issue of jurisdiction by registration have found that that option to withdraw is not truly voluntary in our modern economy. For example, the Delaware Supreme Court in genuine parts where it was discussing jurisdiction by registration, found that that is not a voluntary option. And the second reason that it's not voluntary is I guess I'm still struggling to understand why. I mean, how much business does one have to lose to make it not voluntary? Uh, well, Chief Justice Kagan, we don't believe there's an exact amount of business that one has to lose, but part of the problem and part of what makes this not voluntary is the compounding nature of jurisdiction by registration. If Ames is allowed to do this, every other state in the union will also be allowed to do this. Well, but the parade of horribles is what you brought out there. It seems to me that it just hasn't happened. What you say, the parade of horribles, there's been time and it hasn't happened in every other state. Justice Callahan, we actually would disagree with that contention. Okay, While go the, for it. There are, currently, <laughs> there are currently eight states who have expressly disclaimed jurisdiction by registration only because of doubt about its constitutionality. In those states, it is presumable that they would have jurisdiction by registration, but when the state Supreme Courts considered it, they felt that there was too much tension between jurisdiction by registration and Daimler. Because of that, they disclaimed the ability to uh, subject the corporations registered there to general jurisdiction. 
Were this court to hold 5101 constitutional, those eight states at a start would be able to, again, reassert jurisdiction by registration. Well, do you concede that in Daimler we did not specifically overrule those cases? We know how to do that, so we didn't do that. This court did not expressly overrule those cases, but in Daimler itself and many other cases, this court did cast doubt upon those cases. Well, how did it cast doubt upon them? I, I just think it's two uh, different things. Daimler is about kind of contact jurisdiction, and then we have another set of cases about consent jurisdiction that granted are old. We haven't had to revisit them for quite a while because they're, they're pretty stable and people understand that if you consent, you subject yourself to jurisdiction. Well, Justice Kagan, as part of those cases being old, they were decided under a different jurisdictional framework, the Penoyer era framework, and specifically looking to note 18, footnote 18 in the Daimler majority opinion, it warned litigants that cases from the territorial Penoyer era should no longer attract heavy reliance today. And that explicit warning well, that what That's not the rule we followed in Burnham. I mean, if tag jurisdiction survives international shoe, surely consent jurisdiction survives international shoe. We've Je never said anything to the contrary. Well, this court has not said anything to the contrary. There are two reasons that Burnham would not control in the situation. The first is that the court distinguished in Burnham from the prior time it considered tradition in Schaefer by the idea of a present versus an absent defendant. And here, in this case, Westlake is an absent defendant. It's a foreign corporation in the state of Ames. Now, Chief Justice Kagan, the second reason that Burnham could not control here is because the court had a different ruling in Schaefer, which preceded it and was a more majority opinion, as opposed to the plurality in Burnham. And when the majority looked to what tradition meant in Schaefer, it first looked to whether that old method of jurisdiction remained valid and where it found that the foundations and the need for that jurisdiction had been eroded, it found that it no longer comported with due process under international shoe. Well, I would agree with you that the consent, you know, as a business, I wouldn't like some of these consent statutes, but you seem to argue that the consent in this case is broader than the consents in other cases that we've said are okay. But is it really correct that a party can never give open-ended consent? Like, for example, let's say the state offered you a billion dollars in exchange for accepting general jurisdiction. Would that be unenforceable? Justice Callahan, we do think that that would probably still be unenforceable. It's slightly different thinking about the state extending an additional benefit there, the money, um, as opposed to requiring someone to accept a burden. But well, it just the, seems like you want to do whatever you want to do, and that you you know that there is no consent out there that would meet your criteria. So, what would meet your criteria? Well, there are two specific things that come to mind that would meet our criteria. The first is if Section 5101 were directed at obtaining something more analogous to specific jurisdiction, that would be a very different case. Part of what makes Section 5101 unconstitutional is that it is requiring consent to general jurisdiction. And we heard a lot today about the interest of the plaintiff in this case, but it's important to remember that whatever the court holds with Section 5101 is not just about Artis's ability to sue the corporation. It is about the ability of any plaintiff from anywhere in the world to come to Ames and force Westlake to stand for suit there. But you're saying that companies can't enter into these agreements. That doesn't sound right. I mean, a, a business should be able to do what it finds is the best is in its best interest. Justice Budd, the unconstitutional conditions doctrine effectively speaks to that. One of the critical differences between the forms of consent that this court has recognized and what Ames is asking for here is who's on either side of that transaction. In most of the consent cases that this court has considered, and in every consent case after international shoe, it has been between two private parties. Here, instead, you have the state attempting to force Westlake to forego its constitutional right. It's not forcing anybody to do anything. Westlake doesn't have to sign. It, it, there's a choice. You make the business decision. Even if Westlake were to have that choice, this option would still be foreclosed by the unconstitutional conditions doctrine. The unconstitutional conditions doctrine recognizes that even if an individual can consent to something, even if an individual can waive their right, 
the state cannot force them to waive that right in order to benefit. So in this case, you have the state of Ames asking Westlake, the corporation, to forego its constitutional right, in this case, the right to be free from general jurisdiction, except for essentially at home. So are you saying you can't waive a constitutional right? It can't be forced by the state to waive a constitutional right. And, how's, and in, how, how is the state forcing Westlake to? I misspoke, Justice Bud. It's not the idea of it forcing the corporation to waive a constitutional right. It's putting the corporation to that choice in the first instance. But you are instance. assuming the answer to the question by saying that the constitutional right is not to be subject to jurisdiction except in the state of a corporation in the state of principal place of business. But that's exactly what's at issue in that case. You can't assume that. I mean, it might be, and many of our older cases say it is, that, that there's no constitutional right if there's consent. Yes, Justice Kagan, while older cases do say that, this court's modern due process cases when it comes to jurisdiction, especially general jurisdiction, have clarified that when it's general jurisdiction at issue, a corporation has the right to be subject to general jurisdiction only where, essentially at home and in its principles. Well, it sounds to me like, excuse me, sir. please. No, go ahead. I, I was just like, you argue that under Daimler you have a due process right only to be subject to general jurisdiction when you are at home. How can that be right? I mean, I see why you like it, but how can that be right? <laughs> uh, Justice Callahan, we believe that under Daimler, that is what must be right. Specifically looking to what Daimler said, in Daimler, the plaintiffs uh, had a jurisdictional theory that would subject a corporation to general jurisdiction everywhere that it did a continuous, substantial, and systematic course of business. And this court rejected that theory. It said that such a theory would be unacceptably grasping. So to answer your question, under Daimler, we feel that this is the result that must be right. It sounds as though you're asking us to overrule all these past cases. So how does the stare decisis analysis go? I mean, stare decisis is or ought to be a pretty high bar. Justice Kagan, Chief Justice Kagan, stare decisis ought to be a high bar, but here that high bar is met. This court generally looks to four factors when considering whether there is a special justification for overruling its precedent. Those four factors are the quality of the precedent's reasoning, consistency with related legal decisions, development of the legal doctrine sense, and reliance interests. On each of those factors, there is no justification for continuing to uphold Pennsylvania Fire. Looking first to the quality of the decision's reasoning, in that case, the court explained that because a agent had been present in a state, they were subject to both specific and general jurisdiction. There was no distinction drawn between specific and general jurisdiction the way that there now is, which underscores the fact that the legal doctrine has developed dramatically since. Well, but there isn't because there was consent. Well, there is I mean, the, 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 the modern doctrine draws a distinction between specific and general when there's not consent to the general jurisdiction. Respectfully, Your Honor, the doctrine has continued to draw the distinction between specific and general jurisdiction, even in some of the consent cases. Looking, for example, to this court's case of Carnival Cruise, there, one of the issues was whether there could be consent when there was no relationship to the forum. And this court has accepted that that is acceptable, but that distinction remains. Can Look, I ask you hypothetically, if I, hypothetically, I'm saying this hypothetically, if I disagree <laughs> with you, that under Daimler, you have a due process right only to be subject to general jurisdiction when you're at home. If I disagree with that, do you lose? Accepting your disagreement, Justice, your hypothetical disagreement, Justice Callahan, we still would not lose. So tell me how you would win if I don't agree with you on that point. Even if you agree that Daimler does not create only that right, Allowing this exercise of general jurisdiction in Section 5101 would functionally undermine the rule anyway. So we would win because of the inconsistency that would exist if you were still allowed to be subjected to general jurisdiction anywhere as long as you registered to do business in that state. So the functional impact of allowing this to stand would be to functionally undermine Daimler. Now, specifically looking to how that undermining would happen, if you look to the text of Section 5101, Westlake is required to register here because it does a continuous and systematic course of business. 
In Daimler, this court had said that a continuous and systematic course of business was insufficient to create general jurisdiction. Because I don't understand what the real gripe here is. I mean, you don't contest that you got notice. You could have structured your conduct to avoid the exercise of jurisdiction. It would have come at a price, but many choices do. Um, there's, 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 uh, why, you know, what's, what's the problem here? To take your latter point first, Chief Justice Kagan, it would have been very difficult, and not just difficult in a hard sense, but legally difficult, for Westlake to structure its conduct to avoid general jurisdiction here. Looking to the text of Section 5101, there is no definition given at any point for what continuous or systematic business looks like. The Ames Supreme Court Well, this is it. I mean, it's true that there might be some hard cases. There always are hard cases on the line. But you have a multinational corporation that's doing business across the United States. That's continuous jurisdiction of a kind that's going to satisfy this statute. There's, there's no real vagueness here. So accepting that they do satisfy the statute, this would still be unfair because it would still deprive Westlake of the predictability of knowing where its primary conduct would subject it to suit. Looking to how Any place that it signs one of these things. If it signs, it's subject to suit. It's very clear. It would be clear that it would be subject to suit, but what is unclear is where its specific conduct would make it subject to specific suit. So while Westlake would know that it could be sued in Ames, it would have no idea where its conduct in the United States would subject it to suit within the United States. General jurisdiction means that a Florida plaintiff could come to Ames seeking the benefit of innovator liability. Well, but you could check for the states that have this innovator, li innovator liability and if go in those states, you're better off. That's true, Justice Callahan. We could avoid doing business in some capacity in those states. There would still be a question of whether we would be subject to innovator liability from our interstate business activity. But putting that aside, it's not just innovator liability. Uh, it could be any sort of suit. The problem here is the lack of predictability about where your forum conduct will subject you to suit. And it's helpful to remember that this case is decided against the backdrop of specific jurisdiction. This court has seen general jurisdiction as a safety valve, as a way to ensure that there is at least one place that a plaintiff will be able to bring a suit. That is a very different conceptualization than what 5101 captures. Section 5101 and others... Well, the question is whether that conceptualization is the right one where the company has itself consented and where the, the state puts a company to a choice and the company itself consents there's nothing unpredictable about what the company is consenting to here. The company doesn't like it because it will subject it to suit across the United States, any place that it signs this agreement. But that's just, uh, you know, I'm sure you'd rather defend every suit in Delaware, <laughs> but there's nothing unpredictable about the opposite system. Chief Justice Kagan, we feel that this is similar to the question that was considered in Daimler. And putting aside briefly the issue of consent or lack of consent, in Daimler... But isn't that the whole issue? That is the whole issue. I mean the issue right here of predictability and the idea that by consenting you would be subject to suit in every state. Justice Sotomayor, concurring in the judgment alone in Daimler, put forth a similar contention that a corporation does know where it's doing continuous and systematic business such that there would be predictability about where that corporation could be sued. Anywhere you're it doing seems continuous... seems like the petitioners make some of their arguments, um, the same arguments under general and under personal, and they seem to sort of go back and forth. Is that a problem in their case? I mean, do the arguments have to stay in personal and general, but it, or can they, can they cross-pollinate? We believe that the two must be held distinct given the reach of Section 5101 and general jurisdiction specifically. It is improper to consider a specific plaintiff's interest in this particular case when whatever this court holds on Section 5101 will bind Westlake in all cases for all suits by all plaintiffs. Your Honors, seeing that my time is elapsing, we respectfully request that you affirm the decision of the Ames Supreme Court and hold 5101 unconstitutional. Thank you. Thank you, counsel.
Counsel. Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the court, I'd like to make two primary points on rebuttal. The first is that Westlake again today fights the substance of innovator liability, even though they've already conceded below that the innovator liability is not at issue here. The important question is how does innovator liability affect jurisdiction? And innovator liability inexorably links every brand name DZ bottle with every bottle of generic DZ because they both have the exact same label and more specifically, a label that Westlake has the exact same legal duty on. Counsel, can and I just point you uh, to the, um, the general liability and in, in opposing counsel talks about how this could happen in every state. And I know you mentioned when you were here up before that it hasn't happened in every state. But don't we have to worry about the fact that it, it could and that, I mean, that's a possibility and, and so that everyone uh, every company would be subject to why, being uh, sued in every single state? Uh, two primary points on that, Your Honor. The first is, I want to be clear, 11, sta 11 states have passed statutes, not judicial opinions, saying that they don't plan to exercise well, consent. They, and that they don't plan to or that they aren't right now? But that they're forbidden from. They'd have to repeal those statutes. But more broadly, even if a couple of dozen states, for example, were to decide that consent to registration is how they want to structure uh, the way their state is, there would still be many options that Westlake has in each one of those states in a way that's very different from doing business jurisdiction. They would have the ability to, for example, uh, use third-party entities. They would have the ability to decide that their localized activity is going to be low enough to be under the registration. And in fact, in many states, in Pennsylvania, for example, uh, violating a registration clause doesn't come with much of a penalty at all. It's a $500 fine, and you can't receive a jury verdict in a non-debt action unless you register on the day the jury goes out and unregister when they come back. I mean, there's a lot of very low bars for these registration statutes, and I think it helps to establish that Daimler and Goodyear were about notice and structuring of conduct. And any time personal jurisdictions that issue, those are what's at play. In the specific jurisdiction context, as the court said in Worldwide Volkswagen, it's always going to be about structure. Do I want to be subject to a lawsuit here or here? I can sever my connection. I can change my connection based on specific jurisdiction. Do you the want same to is respond true. to when I asked um, counsel for Westlake, if I don't agree that Daimler stands for the proposition that you can only be sued at home, do you lose? Um, what's your response to that? But no, Your Honor, and it also depends on how Your Honor comes to that decision. So the first is, does due process have to do with the general process by which jurisdiction is exercised, or does it have to do with an actual substantive right flowing from the decisions? If it's about the process, consent is still valid. But even if you decide that general jurisdiction itself is a substantive right, under the unconstitutional conditions doctrine, a relationship can be sufficient to overcome unconstitutional conditions. I see my time has expired, so I ask this court to reverse the Supreme Court of Ames and find jurisdiction straightforwardly fair. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Thank you to all the counsel. Okay, I think we get up now, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> all rise. Thank you, you can all be seated. Um, I think I have some awards to give out, which you've all waited patiently for. Uh, and then um, we'll all make a, a few remarks and then uh, retire for the night, and, and uh, the three of us will also speak to the teams upstairs individually. Uh, this was. Uh, I'll give my remarks later, but I'll just say uh, right now, this was absolutely great, and it did not seem obvious at all uh, who, should, who should go home with the prizes, um, but had to make a decision. So uh, the best oralist uh, goes to uh, Morgan Sandu. Uh, 
the best brief goes to petitioner, the Carrie Buck team. And the best overall team, is that the, the uh, third one? The best overall team? Uh, also goes to the petitioner, the Carrie Buck. So congratulations, you all did a really marvelous job. Uh, she can reclaim her title now of Chief Justice, <laughs> bud. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I just want to say how impressed I am with uh, all of you. You know, to decide to do this and to carry through all the way up into the finals, I know it takes a lot of extra work. I mean, not like you, you don't have other things that you have going on. And you were beautiful, you just did it beautifully. Everybody knew their, their case, they knew their issue. They were, everybody was responsive, you were poised, you weren't looking at any notes, you would listen to the question and answered it the best you could, knowing that, you, that there were <laughs> holes in your case, right? And so I just really, um, this is something that you're gonna remember and be able to draw on for the rest of your lives. So really congratulations and thank you for doing this. Justice Callahan. Well, I have to say, this is one of those situations where I could decide this case much more easily than I could pick between all of you advocates. I mean, and between the briefs as well. Um, I have to go to court this Thursday and Friday in Phoenix, and I'm going to be so disappointed in the lawyers. I'm just going <laughs> to tell you that right now. But you've set such a high bar. I mean, it was such a pleasure. Um, in reading the briefs, I actually described that I loved both of your introductions in the briefs. They were so much fun. I mean, it was just, I, and you know, I'm not such a geek that I just always have fun reading briefs. I'm not gonna tell you that. So the, the briefs were really, uh, really fun to read and just, and, you know, really kind of page burners, I have to say. And uh, you were all so poised and I would, you know, I know how hard you worked to be here, but that you could, you know, I would be delighted to have you appear in front of me tomorrow and you could hold your own with any of the people that I see. And you all, you know, you had different personalities, you had different styles, but I really, there really, I didn't see one, there was not a major faux pas. You know, sometimes when you judge these, someone gets the deer in the headlights look and it's it's kind of scary for them um but you were all just amazing you all answered the questions and it was so difficult and um and it was so close so beautiful job all of you the deer in the headlights look i understand that uh just a couple of years ago, wasn't it, that um, somebody stood up at the podium and promptly fainted, <laughs> but then went on to win Best Oralist, isn't that? <laughs> I, I might be making that up, but. <laughs> um, I, I wanna uh, give a few thank yous. First, you can, can take uh, the girl out of the deanship, but not the deanship out of the, the girl or something <laughs> like that. Um, so, um, so uh, these people were thanked earlier this evening, but just uh, here at the event itself, um, I wanna thank uh, all the people who uh, arranged this for the BSA, and especially Kareem and Stacy and Julia, who did such a great job. As, 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 as hard as the participants in this um, event work, so too the organizers of this event put in some long, hard hours, and it really showed. Um, so thank you all. I want to uh, thank Yvonne Smith, the indefatigable, indefatigable, um, uh, uh, I, I, I mean, does she ever get tired of doing this, I want to know? <laughs> 
um, because Avon uh, has been at Harvard Law School since 1987, which was uh, the year after I um, was I graduated, which is sort of you know I'm I'm uh, I'm kind of old these days, you know. <laughs> Um, so uh, Yvonne was uh, uh, doing this job all the way through my deanship, so I, 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 I can't, I, I, year after year I thanked Yvonne, uh, and year after year she really, um, uh, you know, I felt really uh, grateful to have her, and so again, thank you Yvonne for doing everything you do. Uh, in absentia, I take it Tejinder Singh is not here, is that right? So I, I do want to thank Tejinder Singh who put together this problem. Um, uh, and uh, he's been doing it for some number of years now. And he, he's just, you know, he's an awesome lawyer. He was a student of mine, um, Mr. Singh was. And uh, uh, he was a great student. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's argued before me on, at, on the Supreme Court and he's a, a, a great advocate. Um, and he had a particularly difficult time or, you know, a difficult task this year because usually he does this with a partner of his. And the partner is somebody who was also a student of mine, uh, who was a classmate of his and um, a great friend of his. But she just uh, bailed out on him this year. And the reason she bailed out on her, him this year is that uh, She's the Solicitor General of the United States now. <laughs> and, and just the reason I say this is because one day she was sitting there where you're sitting now, as was Mr. Singh. Um, and uh, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road, who knows? Um, uh, uh, people have gone on to incredible things from where you're sitting. Uh, after doing the kind of job that, uh, that you did today. Um, so uh, congratulations on having done a fantastic job and congratulations on all the great things that all of you, the oralists and the non-oralists alike, uh, are going to do in the future. This was incredibly fun for me personally. I mean, I picked up um, all these materials this morning. I hadn't looked at them uh, prior to that. And I said, oh my gosh, this is about Ford. <laughs> uh, so it's like, okay, I can do this pretty quickly. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, it was a lot of fun for me to, uh, to look at Ford again and to look at this problem and to try to figure it all out. Um, so uh, I take it that this was just a coincidence that Mr. Singh put the problem together before he knew I was coming. Um, but you know, you can tell him that he 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 uh, he, he produced a really uh, fun oral argument for me. But partly, it was really fun because of the quality of the briefing and the arguments in this case. Um, uh, the the briefs were really a pleasure to read. You kind of read one and you thought that's fantastic, and then you read the other and you thought that's fantastic too. You know. <laughs> Uh, who's going to get this prize? Um, and that's the same way I felt listening to all of you do the arguments. You were, um, uh, uh, each, each of you, um, uh, as, 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 as Judge Callahan said, had your own style, so you weren't interchangeable at all. And, and an important thing for an advocate is to develop a personal style and to sort of be the person you are. And you could see uh, that, uh, each of you had um, his or her own style, but uh, but it was uh, you know, and it was great. Um, uh, each of you in your own way, and and so we had a hard time picking as, between the briefs, and we had a hard time picking among the oralists. And all of you did a really fabulous job, and I look forward to talking with you more upstairs. But um, uh, I know that you know, uh, I, I know how many countless hours. Uh, uh, people put in in this event, and again, both the oralists and the um, uh, you know their you know the brief writers, the 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 uh, uh, you know, the oralists get the kind of glamour roles, um, but the other people on the team are just as important. And 
Um, and uh, all 12 of you really should feel very proud of yourselves. And the family and the friends who are here, uh, all of you should feel super proud of them. And uh, congratulations again. So have a good night, and uh, to the teams, we'll see you upstairs.